Hello guys, this is Paul McCorder from TopTechBoy.com and we are here today with lesson number three in our new Arduino tutorial series where we are going to learn how to develop an inertial measurement unit. What we are going to learn about today is we are going to learn about how accelerometers work and how to understand the data that is coming off of our BNO055 Adafruit inertial measurement system. If you haven't watched the first two videos, you need to go back and watch those. This video is a follow-on from the first two videos. I will need you now to pour yourself a magnificently large mug of ice-cold coffee. No sugar needed. It's excellent just the way it is. And I'm going to need you to show me your homework. You remember I gave you a homework assignment in lesson number two. And so let's just jump in now to where we left off in lesson number two. And let's talk a little bit about the homework. Where I left you in lesson number two is I would showed you how to connect up, how to wire up the BNO. 055 non-axis sensor and we are connecting it here to an Arduino Nano. Good thing is it's an I2C sensor and so we just need the SCL and SDA connections. Very, very easy to hook up. And then I went through some sample code over here and that sample code showed you how to measure the three axis of acceleration. Okay, the three axis of rotation, which is rotation around X, rotation around Y, and rotation around Z, and then how we could look at the strength of the Earth's magnetic vector along the x-axis of the sensor, along the y-axis of the sensor, and along the z-axis of the sensor. Now what we did was we just went out to the sensor, and we grabbed those vectors off of the sensor, and then we just printed them out here in the serial monitor. And what we wanted to see was just like, okay, as we move this thing around, all those numbers changed. And so we just wanted to see that we were talking to the sensor, but weren't really going in and trying to analyze or make any sense out of the device. We got it hooked up right. We can send it a command. It sends us data. Now we've got to understand what it means. And specifically, what I asked uh, you to do was to look at the three acceleration numbers acceleration in the X direction. Let me see if I can get oriented with you a little better. Acceleration in the X direction, acceleration in the Y direction, and acceleration in the Z direction. And what your homework assignment was, was to modify the code where you're look, only looking at acceleration X, acceleration Y, and acceleration Z, then looking at those numbers and seeing if they made sense and seeing if you could kind of make sense out of them. So that's what we're going to do with the overarching goal today is understanding how accelerometers work. So let's go in and see how we would do the homework first of all. All this first stuff we want to keep, right? This is all stuff we need to run the sensor. And then we come down, we turn the sensor on, we wait, we measure temperature, uh, we do a little bookkeeping, and then these were the commands here that actually go out and pull data from the sensor. And you can see that we're saying talk to the IMU, get a vector with three elements, and put the data in a name acceler acceleration ACC, and then the vector we want to get off the sensor is vector underscore accelerometer. If this doesn't make sense, go back and watch the earlier lesson. Now since we're just doing acceleration, we don't need to measure the gyro and we don't need to measure the magnetometer. And so I'm going to take those two lines of code out from the earlier code that we did. And similarly, I don't want to print the gyro data and I don't want to print the magnetometer data. And so I am going to take that out. And it'll just make it a lot easier to read. I will also take out this comma after acceleration Z. Okay, so what are we doing? We're setting things up in the void setup. Then we come down here, we give an Adafruit sensor command to go talk to the IMU. We tell it to get a vector. We're expecting three numbers in the vector. And then we're going to put it in the word we're going to call these values that we get ACC, short for accelerometer. Then what did we name our object? We had named it up above my IMU. So we're telling my IMU to get the vector. 
and we're going to be getting it from the add a fruit BNO055. And then what vector do we want? We want to get the accelerometer vector. That goes out and it gets the accelerometer vector, three numbers, and puts it with ACC, the word. So we're going to print out ACC, and then we're going to print out the X value of ACC. That's acceleration in the X direction. Then we're going to print out ACC dot Y. That's going to be acceleration in the Y and similarly acceleration in the Z. And we better put a print LN here so that it goes to the next line. So while you see all this data streaming across, after we do this, we're just going to expect three numbers, acceleration in X, acceleration in Y, and acceleration in Z. And then we're going to try to kind of make sense of that. So let's see if we can download this. I need you to hold your breath. Oh, oh. Download, download, download. Ah, yes, okay, it downloaded. And now what we should see on our serial monitor is boom, I am seeing three numbers, okay? I am seeing three numbers. So now we need to kind of think about what these numbers mean. So am I moving? No, I'm not moving. So if I look at the first number that's streaming by here, that's acceleration in the x direction. I'm seeing 0 0.08, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.07. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now, what would you expect it in a perfect world? You would expect it to be zero. But there's a little bit of noise, so it's getting a little bit of a measurement even when the thing isn't moving. It's not moving in the x direction. And so you would expect zero, but now let's look. If I move it in the x direction, look at that. I'm getting those, that first number is really changing, okay? Now I let it still, and the acceleration in the x direction goes back to zero. Now if I look at the second number that's scrolling by, that's acceleration in the y-axis, and that's like 0 0.01, 0 0.02, 0 0.01. It's not moving. There should be no acceleration in Y. That makes sense. Now let me accelerate it in Y. And wow, look at those things. They are really going in the Y direction. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Okay. Now, on your homework, what doesn't make sense? What doesn't make sense is, as I'm sitting here with this not moving, it is measuring an acceleration in the z direction of about 10. Does that make sense? Well, at first glance, no, it doesn't, because is it, is it accelerating? Is it moving up and down in z? No, it's not. Now, if I move it up and down in z, that number really changes, right? I'm seeing between 3 and 12 there as I move it. So it seems to be sensing things in the z direction, but it doesn't really make sense. Okay, let's see. I am going to live dangerously here. I'm going to live dangerously, very dangerously. I'm going to see if I can kind of get a better, better view of this, and I hope you guys will kind of play along with me at home. I think this is probably going to be a window view. And now let's see if I can call up the serial monitor like that. Okay. Uh, all right, so you can kind of see it like that. Okay, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Okay, so you see what the problem is. The problem is that 10 number while we are standing still. What I'd also like to do, I'm going to see if I can go ahead and come over here. And instead of looking at the serial monitor, I'm going to look at the serial plotter. And let's see if we can get this to kind of plot this data. All right. Okay, so we've got this anomalous, it's, it's blue is X, red is Y, and green is Z. And what we've got is kind of this anomalous behavior. And what the anomalous behavior is, is this thing is sit, sitting still, acceleration in X is zero, acceleration in Y is zero, but then acceleration in Z is not zero. Let me get a little bit further out of your way here and kind of get this where we can both see it good. Okay, now watching this graph, I'm going to just move this. Uh, I really would like 
for you to be able to see that. Give me just a second, guys, and don't hate on me for this, okay? Don't hate on me, but I want to see if I can add a camera view here. Oh, that's not too bad, is it? Okay, and let's see. I do think I need to get a little further out of your way. Real-time editing, and then let me get this up here like this. Okay, I think that's pretty good where you can see everything that you need to see. Okay, so you see X, X is along this axis, so this is pointing in the positive X direction. So watch the red as I just go, or I'm sorry, blue, right? If you look, it is, let me go back. Okay, if you look up at the top of the window, the first one is blue, so blue is the acceleration in the X direction. Okay, and so as I accelerate in the X direction, it accelerates. Now you see the red moving a little bit, and that's just because I am not moving this perfectly horizontal. There's very good cross-axis isolation, and if I could move it more perfectly, you would see blue moving and you would not see red moving. So acceleration in the X direction is giving me acceleration in the X direction. Now let's try to move it along the Y axis, which is like this. And then what I see is now I'm getting red, which is Y, and very little blue. And the very little blue is just because I am not moving it perfectly. Okay, now let's look at that strange green one up there, which is Z. Okay, if I go up and down in Z, indeed, I do see that signal changing. But I got this built-in, I got this built-in, about 10 for acceleration. So what does that mean? I'll give you a hint. This is in meters per second squared for acceleration. And this really kind of gets at the heart of understanding how an accelerometer works. Okay, this really sort of gets at the heart of understanding how an accelerometer works. And what you have to see is you have to see that an accelerometer does not measure acceleration. An accelerometer measures the force that is acting on a suspended body. So I am sitting in a chair and so you could sort of consider me as a suspended body and in fact I will hold the sensor so I have censored myself. Okay, Now is there any force on me in the X direction? No, there is not. Okay, there is no force on me in the X direction. Now, if there was, what would happen? I would move. Let's say that a wind comes along. Okay, did you see how that wind blowing me, you're seeing my acceleration as reflected in, uh, as reflected in the Y. Okay, now I could also go like this. Now, that's really Y. Okay, now the wind blows in X and you see the blue, right? And then in Y, you see the red. So as the wind tosses me left and right, you see it in the X. Forward and backwards, you see it in uh, the red. Okay. I'm sorry if I've said these backwards because I'm kind of a little confused on the orientation. But you can see that X is blue okay, and Y is is red. Now why is, so what you agree is while I'm sitting here and the wind's not blowing, there's no force on me in the X direction, there's no force on me in the Y direction, but what's different about Z? Is there a force on me in the Z direction? Oh yeah, right? It's the force of gravity. So what is Z measuring? Z is measuring the force of gravity. You could think of it as positive force is down and therefore that gravity is pulling down and I can feel it it's pulling me down okay it is pulling me down and so that is why you're getting an acceleration when you're sitting still because the accelerometer does not measure 
acceleration, it measures the force on a suspended mass. Okay, so let's talk now about how an accelerometer actually works. All right, I hope I haven't confused you, but we're going to keep talking about this, so just, just stick with me here. Okay, stick with me. Let's talk about how an accelerometer works, and let me see if I can find a good overhead view. I believe this is a good overhead view here. Let me get a little focus. All right. What you have to do in order to understand an accelerometer, and let me try to refocus here. Uh, let me give it something to focus on. Okay, there, I believe it has focused now. All right, so in order to understand how an accelerometer works, you have to understand how a capacitor works. And so let me see if I can draw a capacitor for you. A capacitor is two parallel plates, okay, two parallel plates with an insulator between them, okay. So let's say that's a top plate. Can you imagine that that's a top plate? Okay, then can you imagine that this is a bottom plate. I wish I could draw better. Okay, I've got a top plate and I got a bottom plate and I have a gap between them and there is an insulator in that gap so you can't conduct electricity from here to here that there is a gap between there and that gap is an insulator. Okay, so this has got some length and some width and then there is some distance between the two plates. And then there is a material between the two plates and while that material is an insulator, it has a dielectric constant. Now, I'm not going to worry about just understand the dielectric is a property of uh, insulating materials. The capacitance of this capacitor C is equal to the dielectric epsilon, we're not going to worry about that because it's a constant, times the area over the gap, over the distance. Okay, so this is the distance, the area is length times width, and so this is what the capacitance of that capacitor is. So let's just say if I made this capacitor twice as long, what would happen? The area would get twice as big, the capacitance would get twice as big. What happens if this gap became twice as big? Well then the capacitance would only be half as much because D would be multiplied by 2, that would be make the capacitance only half as big as it was before. So you see a capacitor is, is really, really, really simple. Kind of ignoring the dielectric because we don't have to worry about that right now because it's a constant. That if this top plate moved up, what would happen? D would get bigger, capacitance would go down. What if we made the area larger? If we made the area larger, the capacitance would go up. Okay, now imagine this. Imagine that this is anchored. Okay, imagine that this capacitor is anchored and imagine this capacitor is suspended from a spring. So this capacitor, I mean this top plate of the capacitor is just kind of floating to where this is on the table. So the bottom plate is mounted on the table and the top plate is above the table mounted on a spring. Okay, what happens if I move this up and down? Well, this plate would move, but this plate would want to kind of stay still, and so the two plates would come closer together. When the two plates came closer together, what would happen? D would go D would go down and capacitance would go up. And so what you have to see is you have to see that with a simple, this is kind of a cartoon one and I'll show you a more realistic one in a minute, but as I move things, the bottom plate is going to move because it has no choice and this one is going to kind of resist moving because it's on a spring, all right? And so if I measure capacitance, so what would I do? I would measure C, which I can do, 
And then since I know the area and I know the dielectric from that, I can then calculate D. Okay, because I know C, I measured it, I know the dielectric, I know the area, and therefore I can calculate D based on my measured C. And that D is going to change. Well, how does it change if I have a mass on a spring, kind of the change in D, the delta D, is going to be proportional. It's called Hooke's Law. It's K, some constant, or let's see, the force is equal to some constant times the change in D, the displacement. Okay, so what else do I know? I know that force is equal to mass times acceleration. And so this is the way it works. This is the way an accelerometer works. And I'll show you a little bit more real one in a minute. But as this moves, the gap changes. So I measure capacitance, and then from that capacitance, I can measure D, and then I can see how much D changed. The force that is being exerted on this one that is on a spring is proportional to K, which is the spring constant, times the change in the distance. That's how much displacement actually occurred. Now, what else do I know? So I measure C. I calculate D. From that, I can calculate the change in D. And then K is just a physical property of the material. So now I know force. And what do I know? I also know that force is mass times acceleration. And I know the mass of this block, so then I can calculate A is equal to the force divided by the mass. And so you can see that by suspending a mass on a spring and then measuring the gap as it moves, I can calculate the change. I can, cal I can measure the change in capacitance. I can use that to calculate the change in distance. I can use that to calculate the force. And then from the force, I can calculate the acceleration. So with a simple suspended mass, I can, I can measure acceleration. But what I'm really, really measuring is I'm measuring this force from this uh, Hooke's Law. Does this at all make sense? OK, so what do we have going on here if we come back to this view and come back over here? OK, uh, let's come back over here. All right, so what is happening in this picture when I am in this orientation? Well, is this just going to be floating in midair? No, the force of gravity is going to be working on this, and it is going to be displaced down a little bit because of gravity. OK, it is going to be displaced down a little bit because of gravity. And that down pulling of that mass is what is leading to is what is leading to this acceleration in the z-axis. OK, it's what's leading to this acceleration in the z-axis. Now, let's think about it. Does that make sense? What would you expect if I turned it upside down? Well, if I turned it upside down, you would expect it to be pulling in the other direction. And so look at that. What happened to the green? Now it is saying that the acceleration is about negative 10 meters per second squared. Why? Because now it is pulling, gravity is pulling in the opposite direction to the sensor because it's upside down. And now it's back to the positive direction. All right. Does that make sense? OK, why is this not going on with the x and the y? Because Gravity is this way. Gravity is not this way and not that way. OK, but what would happen if I took this and if I pulled y into the up direction, right? This is the y-axis, right? Let's see if I can show this. This is the y-axis. What if I pulled that y-axis up? And remember, let's see if I can move this. Uh, let's see. I might be able to let you see this a little better. 
I think it might be better if it's over here so you can see it all together. Okay, so and then I think maybe I can even make this come across bigger like that. I think that'll look a little better. Okay, so now why is like this? Why is the second one, which is red? So what do you think is going to happen if I turn this up on its side? What do you think is going to happen to red? Okay, all of a sudden now, red sees, right? Red sees the gravitational vector. Y sees the gravitational vector. What happened to Z? Z is no longer seeing it because Z is pointing, Z is pointing this way now, right? Z is pointing, where's my little pointer? Z is pointing this way now, so he doesn't see gravity anymore. Okay, what if I flip it the other way? Now, X sees the opposite, or your Y sees the opposite, right? Y sees the negative, the positive, the negative. Z doesn't see anything, X doesn't see anything, only Y sees something. Well, what's the obvious thing to do now? Turn it where X, it's standing up on its X axis. And now, who sees gravity? Okay, let me see if I can show you better here. Who sees gravity now? The X accelerometer sees gravity. Who sees gravity now? The Y sees gravity. Who sees gravity now? The Z. Does that make sense? Okay, does that make sense? And what you have to think about is, you have to think that you have You have to think, that is a little bit of a crazy shot, isn't it? Okay, I like this one. What you have to think is, is that right now it's oriented like this, and the gravity is pulling this down. Okay, it's pulling this down. If I orient it like this, then the other axis sees it. Does that make sense? All right. Now, what I've kind of waved my hands about is, is that, you know, I've kind of created this hypothetical structure. And so you could imagine one capacitor like this, and then you could imagine another capacitor like this. And so this would be the X capacitor, and then this would be the Y capacitor. And then back here you could have, okay, this is the Z capacitor. This is the X capacitor, and then you could imagine this being a Y capacitor. So imagine this just oriented orthogonally in two other direction, and you had three of these. Okay, but that's not the way they really do it. And the real accelerometers are more complicated than this. And so let me see if I can switch to a view and show you. You know, this just shows you how you can relate capacitance. Okay, you can relate capacitance to D and then D to F, and then F to A. Let me show you that. So I measure capacitance, and as capacitance changes, that's a change in D. And then that change in D can be turned into a change in force, and then that change in force gives me the acceleration. That is how these things work. They work with capacitors. But this is not the way the capacitors are made. And so I'm going to show you a more realistic cartoon of how the capacitors actually look. And I am going to try to go to, let's see, that is the view that I want. All right, so this is what we start with. These are little structures, like imagine little beams, little conducting beams. So this is a conducting beam. So I'm showing you, you're looking at it from the top but these have some thickness to them that you can't see, but they are mounted on the substrate. They are mounted on the table. So all of these little beams are mounted on the table and they have some thickness that they raise up above the table. It's just kind of hard to draw in three dimensional. Now this is the movable piece, okay? This piece is free to move around. Remember like in our earlier picture, this plate that was suspended on a spring. 
well, this is the plate, and the way we're going to do it, because these things got, got to kind of stay flat, we're going to mount them on these four springs on the corners. So this spring is kind of on a pillar that's tied to the substrate. This spring is on a pillar tied to the substrate. This spring is on a pillar tied to the substrate. And this spring is tied on, to a pillar on the substrate. But those springs, I wish my proof mass here was a little more rigid because it really is perfectly flat. So you see how this pink mass is floating, is floating slightly above the table suspended by these four springs. Okay, now what I want you to think is, what I want you to see is, is that if I, between here and here, I have a capacitor because I have a plate that is free to move. I have a plate that is fixed to the substrate. And then this pink part is free to move because it's sitting on springs. So if I move like this, okay, if I move like this in the Y direction, what is that proof mass going to do? It's not going to want to move. And so it's going to kind of go like this, that the substrate is going to move, but this proof mass is going to displace this way. Remember, capacitance is epsilon A over D. So while, I, while I'm moving, what happens here? D goes down, capacitance goes up. And so as I am moving in the Y direction, what happens is this proof mass goes back and forth. OK, what I want you to see is let's say that I move it this way and the proof mass gets displaced like this. The gap between here and here gets smaller the capacitance goes up. The gap between here and here gets bigger, the capacitance goes down. And you see that you have a differential signal between these two, and that differential signal means it's easier to get an accurate measurement because as this capacitance is going down, this one is coming up. And so if I measure the capacitance between here and the movable shuttle, and here in the movable shuttle, I have a signal that represents acceleration in the y direction. Does that make sense? Now, what happens if I if I move it this way? As it's moving, it's going to displace this way. But after it stops, what's going to happen? Well, the springs are going to bring it back to the neutral position. So you only get a signal while you're moving. OK, so with this, you can see that I can measure acceleration in the y direction by measuring the capacitive displacement of this center shuttle. Does that make sense? Now, understand these are real mechanical objects. These are real mechanical objects that if I could pop the lid off of this sensor and I had an extremely, extremely powerful microscope, you could actually see something that would look a little bit like this. In fact, I think I've got a picture of a real one here, maybe. OK. This is a picture of a real one. Now, you see I have a lot more fingers than what I'm drawing, but I'm just drawing a few fingers so that you can kind of understand it. OK. I'm just drawing a few fingers so that you can understand it. So let's come back over here to my cartoon one. So if I move like this, Gap changes, gap changing, changes capacitance. Okay, changing capacitance, I can, I can read, right? So I read capacitor, capacitance changes. That tells me that there was a change in force, and from that I can calculate the acceleration. That is what is going on under the hood of these things, okay? But it's not like you have, in the old days, the way they did it is they would have one accelerometer oriented this way, they would have a second accelerometer oriented this way, so the second axis you got from that one, and then they had a third one oriented this way. And so with three accelerometers, you could measure acceleration in the x, acceleration in the y, and acceleration in the z. But then they got clever, and they started doing it a little bit differently. Okay, And if you do things cleverly, you can measure acceleration in x, y, and z all from this same device. Okay, So if I move it like this, what's going to happen? This is going to change the gap is going to change, 
the capacitance between here and here changes because of that, that changing gap. All right. But now, what happens if I move it like this? Well, if I move it like, let me get it lined up here. If I move it like this, okay, this isn't going to want to move, and so you're going to be displaced like this. Now, what I want you to see is what changed. This gap didn't change, but what changed? This is the area, right? The area between here and here. This is the area of the capacitor. You see, this is a larger area, and this is a smaller area. So this capacitance changes as you move like this, not because the gap is changing, but because the area is changing. Now, you would have to keep track of where you're measuring this way and where you're measuring this way, and so all of these aren't going to be connected together, but you can see that motion like this is going to change the capacitance. That is x-axis acceleration. Motion like this is going to change the gap, and that's going to change the distance, and that's going to change the capacitance, and that's going to be x acceleration, y acceleration. All right, what do we still have to worry about? We still got to worry about z. Well, hey, what if I do this? What if I build an electrode down here, okay, and then bring out an electrical connection, and then remember that this was suspended like this? What's going to happen is the device moves up and down. It's going to come like this, and then that gap is going to change. And so if I measure the capacitance between the plate and this connection, I can measure that Z. So you see, I measure three capacitances. A changing capacitance as the gap changes, a changing capacitance as the area changes, and then a changing capacitance as the vertical gap changes. Measure three capacitors, and I get three forces. And from those three forces, I get three accelerations. Does this at all make sense? This is complicated, but I am really trying to help you see how it works. And then you got to understand, too, these things are absolutely tiny. This whole thing would be very much smaller than the diameter of a human hair. And these pictures like this are taken with extremely powerful microscopes. And that center shuttle, I can't point at it, but the center part that has the holes in it, it's kind of like this part. That is the movable part. And then over here, these right here are the fixed parts. So again, you've got movable fingers movable fingers interdigitated with non-movable fingers. That, my friend, is how an accelerometer works. And so let's come back and let's look at this, okay? Why, sitting right here, why am, is the green measuring 10? Why is the green measuring 10? Can I get both of these things on here? I hope so. Okay. So I will pull this down. All right. I want you to see all this at once. And I know I'm rambling, but it is so hard. And people do not understand how these things work. And I want you to understand how these things work. Okay, so you see the data, you see the sensor, and you see the cartoon. This is the orientation that I am in here. And in this orientation, why am I reading an acceleration on the z-axis? Because the force of gravity, instead of sitting up here like this, the force of gravity is the force of gravity is pulling this down, right? It's pulling it down, and then that is causing that signal like that. Now, if I turn it like this, okay, if I turn it up like this, then the force of gravity is going to be pulling it this way. 
right? So let's try that. When we do that, what happens? You see, y is seeing. y is seeing it now because it's like this. Now if I turn it like this, now what is going to be seeing gravity? The x. Does this make sense? You guys, leave your comments down below. Leave your questions down below. It's almost like if this doesn't make sense, maybe we ought to have a live stream on it. Okay, maybe we ought to have a live stream on it. But what I've tried to show you is accelerometers work by having a mass on a spring, and when the substrate moves, it has to kind of pull along the movable mass. That leads to a capacitive signal. That capacitive signal you can detect as a uh, that capacitive signal you can detect by measuring capacitance and then you can calculate the displacement and from that you can calculate the uh, acceleration. Wow <clears throat> this has been a complicated topic and I hope I have sort of explained how it, it works. If you don't understand leave a question down below. Maybe uh, maybe what we can do is maybe we can have a live stream to talk about this if it doesn't make sense. So what we have done is your homework was to kind of try to explain why you're seeing data when the thing isn't moving and I've done my best to try to uh, to try to explain that. What we're going to do next week is we're right now just taking the raw data off of this and we're looking at quantitative or we're looking at qualitative trends in the data that you see it kind of qualitatively makes sense as I move it and you see the data. But when we want to do real orientation and get real measurements, what we need to do is we need to have calibrated data. And so what we're going to talk about next week is we're going to talk about how to start getting calibrated signals off of the BNO055. Uh, okay, I hope this made sense. Paul McWhorter from toptechboy.com. I will talk to you guys later.